Alrighty. So our speaker's bio, Kalki Subramaniam is an Indian transgender activist, artist, poet, actor, and writer. Kalki is the founder of Sahadori or Sahadari, I'm sorry, Foundation, an organization which works for the social, political, and economic empowerment of transgender people in India. Kalki is one of the most prominent voices in the LGBTQI community of India. She's spoken to over a million students across India and is known for her relentless and fierce activism for establishing social justice and equality for transgender people. Along with her fellow activists, she championed and lobbied for the recognition of legal rights of transgender people and the efforts paid off with the Supreme Court of India legally recognizing transgender persons' rights in 2014. She received numerous awards for social work, film, performance, and her literary contributions. And on March 8th, 2015, International Women's Day, Facebook chose Kalki as one of the 12 inspiring women of the world who use Facebook as a community development platform for empowerment. In 2016, Kalki was nominated by the L'Oreal Paris India as Woman of Worth under the Arts category. Her collection of poetry in Tamil titled Kuri Aruthian was published in 2014. It's been hailed as an outstanding work of poetry. Many of those poems appear in English in this book. Kalki's debut in Indian film in the Indian film world happened with Nakarthi, an offbeat Tamil film about the life journey of a transgender woman, her quest for happiness, love, and finding her identity and true happiness. She became the first trans transgender actor in India to do a lead role in a major motion picture. And she recently released the book, We Are Not the Others, the one of a kind book, which is a collection of poetry, essays, monologue, and concert conversation and art is available. Kalki lives in Palachi, India. And now without further ado, please help me in welcoming our lecturer for tonight and our speaker, Kalki Subramaniam. Hello and uh, good morning everyone and uh, good evening to you as well and greetings to everyone around the world who has joined in the conversation and in my presentation about the power of art in social change. I'm Kalki Subramaniam and first of all I am very thankful to be invited uh, to the University of South Florida Department of uh, Gender and Women's Studies and uh, for especially for the Visibility and Remembrance Exhibition where my art as well as uh, my team, the transgender artists, artworks have been exhibited. We are truly excited about it. To begin with, um, I was born as a Sabri in a very small town called Polachi, but which is very beautiful uh, in the southern state of India called Tamil Nadu. A very rich, uh, diverse, but very ancient cultures that exist one, uh, in India. The Tamil language which I speak is one of the most oldest and ethnic languages in the world, like Greek, Hebrew, and Sanskrit. So I was born uh, in Polachi and um, in a family, in a, in a middle class family where my father was uh, into transport business and my mother was a homework, uh, home worker, home manager. I had an elder sibling and a younger sibling, both of them women. I was the only son, only born son, only born male. Um, very happy family indeed. But around the age of uh, 9, 10, and intensively at the age of 12, I felt different. I felt the differences between my body my, and my soul, especially my gender. Uh, the assigned gender at birth was different from 
the perceived, my perceived gender. I felt so different and uh, it was difficult for me initially. Particularly my teenage years were very tormenting. There was this internal struggle about finding an identity of my own. At a very young age, being a child, it was so difficult. Even at a very young age as a child, and at the age of 13, I felt suicidal. And upon that, there was severe bullying at school, like all transgender children face, and also LGBT children, LGBT children face. I have faced bullying too, but at a very young age, when you face it, it, it also affects um, your mental well-being, of course. So in spite of uh, all that bullying, I still went to school. But I used to escape and bunk my school a lot many times. And I used to run to the nearest forests and parks. And particularly in the parks, I used to spend all day because I was afraid of the human beings I wanted to hide in nature. So that is where I found in the evenings, I found my transgender folks who then were to become my lifelong friends. I met some of the most fascinating transgender women there. Apsara was one of those um, transgender women uh, older than me, I found. She was immensely talented. She was a great cook. And uh, now she still works as a uh, catering into catering business and makes awesome biryani, a delightful dish. She can even cook for more than 2,000 to 5,000 people at a time. And I also met Manju, who was a sex worker. Well, Apsara was partially accepted by her parents, even though her brother was transphobic. Manju was completely abandoned by her parents. She was a sex worker. Being a transgender and a sex worker is a double discrimination. And she was HIV positive as well. So there was a triple discrimination as well. At a very young age, I understood the plight of the transgender people. And I remember uh, when I was walking with Manju on a street one evening uh, in a small street, there's not too many people on the streets. Suddenly there was an auto rickshaw, a tuk-tuk, that appeared in front of us. And then somebody from that pulled Manju into it. And I saw that there were seven men inside uh, two autos, two auto rickshaws. And they kidnapped her. And I was terrified. I ran to home. I didn't know what to do. I was sleepless the whole night. The next morning, I came running to her house. It was locked, but after some time, I saw that she came in, in another auto rickshaw and her sari was torn and I could see marks on her face. And she was sobbing. She opened her little house and went inside and I also went. And I asked her what happened. And she told me, she was crying, weeping, and she told me that she was raped by seven men all night. So I didn't even know what rape was. But I told her, let's go to the police and give a complaint. She told me that I'm a sex worker, I'm a transgender. The police will question only me. They'll ask me, why do I go to sex work? And I have to face all this. I couldn't choose any other profession because I am not getting any other job opportunities. And this is the only thing that society has left me. That is when at the age of 13, I understood the plight of transgender women in this country and around the world. Their safety and security is always in question. In a transphobic world, trans people are very vulnerable and innocent, harmed, harmed because
because we are very vulnerable. And that is one of the experiences in my life at a very young age that left me wounded for the rest of my life. But from that wound bloomed many flowers and my rage as well. I had this rage against this society and that was from which stemmed a lot of uh, things. I used to run and hide into the forest, sit on the, under the trees, take a pen and a paper, and I used to visualize what I want to be in the future. I wanted to be a girl with, a, with, with, with beautiful dresses and garlands and all that. Yes, I used to draw that. But I also drew that I was a warrior. I also drew that I also um, used to do drawings that I was a warrior. And uh, I remember at a very young age, I was very, see, uh, very clearly seeing the condition of trans people. Uh, I was terrified about my own life. But at the same time, I think because of my anger of what happened to Manju and also to Apsara. Apsara's elder brother threw kerosene on her and tried to burn her. She ran away and she hid at a friend's place and also in my place. It was, it was very difficult. And I've seen a number of other transgender friends of mine run away from our homes to Mumbai and Delhi and becoming sex workers and beggars. I've seen it for so many, many years. And that is when I decided to be a strong voice for our community. And I didn't know what, how to do it, what to do it. And I chose, when I finished my schooling, I did my bachelor's degree in English, and then I chose master's degree in international uh, relations. And before that, I did master's degree in journalism and mass communication. I was good in languages and communication, and I wanted to put uh, that into my writing and my uh, journalism. I believe in the power of pen and I believe in journalism, the power of journalism, the power of journalists and writers. So I did two things. I opened a blog in 2000, uh, I think in 2006, I opened a blog in 2005, I guess. Yes, I opened a blog and simultaneously I was uh, once I finished the education, I joined and uh, I joined an IT company. And what I learned there helped me to start a magazine of my own first time for the transgender community. With the help of an NGO, the magazine was distributed among only among the transgender community of my district. I chose journalism because uh, at that time, the mainstream media was very stereotyping transgender and gay people. The media was completely transphobic and were very much stereotyping trans people. It was always about, the, especially the pronouns used for trans people were very degrading. The language used was also very degrading. So we had a number of issues, health issues, family rejection, homelessness, joblessness, and uh, mental health was in question. And there's no policy to protect us. Nobody spoke about us. No politician ever spoke about us in the House of Assembly or in the Parliament. And we were one of the very, very invisible minorities in the country. So I chose it. I chose journalism. I, br I brought this magazine. But even before that, at school when I was hiding in the forest, I used to draw and I used to write. That was my, I, that was my outlet to 
talk about my gender expressions. I used to visualize, I used to visualize what I wanted to be. That used to be a joy. Uh, I, I used to write about, uh, and uh, I used to write about my pain and, and uh, the pain of other trans persons that I knew. Generally, trans people were discriminated and uh, uh, named as well. It was difficult. There was a lot of public shaming as well. And upon that, the movies were very stereotyped. Like how many years ago, not even many years ago, a few years ago, Hollywood was, how Hollywood was to trans people, very stereotyping. The same way Indian movies were also, Tamil movies, Hindi movies were also very stereotyping trans people. As we are idiots, sex forwards, clowns and all that. So there was, there was a lot of things uh, for me to do and for activist people to do too. I did my part. Um, when I drew what I wanted to be in my early teenage years, in my struggling years, that is also when I found that that was a great outlet for me to express myself. What I couldn't tell to my parents what I couldn't say to my friends and to my teachers. I put everything into the paper. I put my pain as poetry and I put my joy as painting and drawing. That was my outlet. And today when I think about it, I don't think I would have survived without doing that. I think at a very young age, that was the power of art in healing me and in aligning me with where I have to go. So when I, when I coming back to my uh, master's degree and after that joining in a company, in an IT company, um, my blogging as well as my journalism, I'm bringing the magazine, made a huge, huge impact within the trans community. So a lot of people joined my team and we used to write columns about uh, uh, mental health and wellness of trans people and what the government has to do, especially bringing out policy and recognizing transgender rights and all that. And even gossip and food recipes and everything also we used to write in, in our magazine. So I was running that magazine for more than two years. And uh, in 2008, I started the Sahodri Foundation. The Sahodri Foundation was started with a very, very few hundred rupees. Initially, we struggled how to do it, where to do it and all that. I and a few of my friends also helped me uh, to helped me in my vision, helped me to open the foundation. And, but I was very clear in my mission and what I wanted to do. Especially the way I wrote, um, the issues I wrote in my blog and as well as in my magazine, that brought invitations from around the colleges and universities. I was invited to speak about transgender people's rights in the colleges. Uh, it was very few, but I used that opportunity full swing. So there was more colleges and universities inviting me to speak. And then came the Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs. So I was being invited, I was beginning to be invited and I became a speaker, a voice of the community. And the local media, uh, took interviews of me and uh, they wrote about, uh, I used that opportunity to talk about transgender people's rights, dilemma and what can be done to empower, uplift up and uphold the rights of our transgender persons. Because many of uh, our community people at that time were 100% into sex work and begging. 
and it was so difficult for them because almost everyone was rejected by their families. Fortunately, in all this travel of mine, journey of mine, my family did not reject me. Even though I remember at the age of 13, when I came out openly to my parents, my mom was devastated. My family was devastated, but they never hated me. They wanted to help me to come out. They, want, they were just afraid that the society will destroy me in the name of transphobia, but they never hated. And I wish that would happen to every transgender child in this country and around the world. Mostly a lot of us trans and gay people and lesbians, when we come out, we are rejected. Not the entire, maybe partially we are rejected or fully we are rejected. And it becomes so difficult for us. I believe that acceptance in the family is absolutely important. Whether if it is your parent or if you're, it's your partner, acceptance in your family is so important for your overall wellness, for your mental well-being and spiritual growth as well. But unfortunately, hundreds and thousands of transgender people around the world to not have that blessing. It is a birthright to be included in the family. But unfortunately, many of transgender people today around the world are homeless and are very vulnerable to be the victims of hate crime, gender-based violence. I remember in 2009, when one of my friend actually wanted to get married, she put her profile in a matrimonial website in India. Uh, in India, we do have many matrimonial websites. If you'd like to marry, you can, um, you can register it in a matrimonial website and you can find a partner. It's like, a, it's like dating websites, but much more serious. And there are several rounds of interviews. So one of my friend registered as a bride in, in a matrimonial website. But the next day her profile was deleted by uh, the webmaster, the controlling team of the matrimonial website. And when she inquired, she got the reply that because she is a trans woman, they will not accept uh, her in the website. So that was a shock to me and to her. And I spoke with my friends. And I was thinking what could be the solution for this? So I thought, why should we beg somebody to do it, uh, to accept us? So I created my own matrimonial website in 2009. It was called Terunangri.net with just six profiles of me and my friends. I was also a bride looking for a partner. So six friends of mine, we, I designed a website overnight and we put all our six people's details, but not the phone number. <laughs> uh, we put all of it, uh, our pictures and our information and what kind of a partner we are looking for to marry and all that. And me and my friends, we went to the Press Club of India. We launched the website with uh, so many press people, television, media, and with the help of uh, journalist friends, we launched the website. And believe me, it went viral. And we every day in my email box, I received hundreds and hundreds of proposals from men around the world. And there were professors and mathematicians, scientists, businessmen, farmers, mechanics, and um, professors, teachers, and entrepreneurs wanting to marry us. I was delighted, it was over, so overwhelming. And I also received some of the most uh, 
funniest proposals as well. For example, there was this this uh, shake from uh, I'm not sure if it was from Kuwait or any other country. I even forgot which country it was. He wrote to me that um, uh, he proposed marriage to me. He wrote to me in the email that uh, I ha already have two wives. I would like to take you as the third one and I'll take care of you with everything you desire. So that was quite funny. And I also received um, another email from a professor in Calcutta. He wrote to me that his wife was ill and he wants to marry a person to take care of his wife. And because he is also important. I don't know why he mentioned to me that he's important. Uh, but these were some of the emails that I received. And uh, all of us received so many hundreds of emails. And out of the 2000 emails we, re we received in one week, 200 we filtered. And then we began to, each one of us began to interview these men. But unfortunately, all we understood was almost 99% of them were all looking for secret marriages. Nobody wanted to come out openly and marry a trans woman. Um, they don't want to take us to their homes. It was it was difficult. Also, at the time in 2009, transgender marriage was neither legal nor illegal. So basically there was no protection for our marriage. Uh, eventually, I and my friends, we understood that marriage is something that isn't, uh, wouldn't give us really uh, the protection that we need. Anyway, I don't believe in marriage. Uh, I'm still single. But I believe that um, for my friends, I have to stand. So I stood up for them and I created an ID for them, myself and for them as well in the matrimonial website. So that was a battle we did. We proved uh, that we deserve mari marriage rights, matrimonial rights, and we proved it. And we also proved that we are wanted as well, that we are no different. As a bride, we are no different. Even though we may not bear children and we don't have a womb because we were not born as women, we don't have a womb, but we are women. It's just that we are women of another type. So no secret marriages. We did not want any secret marriages. We want open marriage, open acceptance. All of us, we wanted open acceptance. And so the idea of marriage was shelved, but we proved that we are equal and we are wanted and we have all the rights to marry. So that was also one of the things that uh, was a project in 2009. Later, I started to work in from 2010. I started to work with the High Court, Supreme Court and uh, District Court Judiciary and lawyers. I worked even with the Chief Justice of India on transgender rights. I worked with the United Nations Development Program as well. Uh, and we spoke in several conferences and forums. I presented on the difficulties, obstacles transgender persons face in India. And years of that kind of a lobbying, along with uh, many of my transgender friends like Priya Babu and uh, Gauri Savant, we all worked intensively in uh, bringing that change. And all that hard work paid in 2015, no, in 2014, on April 15, the Supreme Court of India legally recognized transgender persons, our legal rights, civil rights, social rights, economic rights. Uh, the Supreme Court also directed the state governments and the central government to implement schemes and welfare measures and to immediately take care of the transgender persons, to look into our homelessness, 
edu education and to solve all the problems of the transgender community, especially our health and joblessness, our livelihood, all these things were underlined and directed by the Supreme Court to the state and the central governments to take welfare measures. That, is, that was the opening of a lot of doors. When Supreme Court knocked that and uh, reclaimed and brought back our uh, rights after almost 200 years. The transgender community in India has always been respected. Right from ancient India. If you look at the Mahabharata and Ramayana, the great epics of India, as well as the sculptures and Vedas of India, trans people were respected. Even in the Mughal period, where the Islamic dynasty was ruling in India, trans people were certainly respected. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the stories, there are very fascinating stories in Mahabharata about one of the characters, Arjuna, becoming a transgender and serving as a martial arts guru and a dance teacher in a palace. And Amba, a, a princess, reborn as Shikandi, the man, the warrior, a man with a soul and a heart of a woman. And also there, is, there are hundreds and hundreds of gender swapping stories in Mahabharata and Ramayana. Even Krishna took the form of a woman, a Mohini, changed the gender. And Krishna and Shiva dance. And then Lord Ayapa was born. A, a god, a lord, a deity, born out of two men. Also out of a man and a trans woman. So we have been having all these beautiful stories in India, culturally, historically, religiously, for more than, th more than 5,000 years. Yet after the arrival of the British and their colonization, in 1872, they introduced the Criminal Tribes Act. And since then, um, in the act, through the act, they criminalized a lot of communities, including jugglers, street dancers, gypsies, and they also criminalized uh, transgender people. Under the law, all these people were born criminals and habitual offenders. And at any time, they can be picked, picked up by the police and put into the jail even without a warrant. So that was one of the downfall that is where uh, the downfall of the transgender community began it was almost after 200 years the supreme court of india again recognized the transgender community's rights it was a long long battle hundreds and hundreds of trans people have sacrificed their lives for that I, a lot of people before me many of them whose names I don't even know. And I do know names like Asha Bharati and Kruba and a lot of people have sacrificed immensely for uh, who we are today. And I follow their path and the younger generation today follows people like me. So we just take one step ahead. So after the um, recognition of uh, our uh, rights, legal rights in 2014 on April 15, many doors opened, especially the university's grand commission opened their doors for trans people to study. Many universities and colleges uh, were open to transgender persons studying in universities and colleges, and they even waived fee. And corporate companies opened their doors for trans people to be included and uh, to pick up any course that they wanted to study. And there were inclusive policies in corporate companies and in academic institutions. And the government uh, started to become inclusive of trans persons. But it was Tamil Nadu that was a pioneer, my state, 
was the pioneer in gender rights and gender equality. The Chief Minister of India, Mr. Karunanithi, introduced the Transgender Welfare Board well even before the Supreme Court of India's recognition. Even in 2008, he, in 2007, he introduced the Transgender Welfare Board in Tamil Nadu. That, is, that was one of the pioneering steps in recognizing transgender persons' rights. Followed by that, a number of states in India recognized transgender persons' rights. And I think uh, it has been 15 years and we have come a long way, a long, long way in the recognition of legal rights. I believe it was not easy. There were so many elements that and partners who made it possible. But one of the partnerships that was truly enticing and powerful was art and artists. Uh, we trans activists partnered with artists and writers, and they helped us and they upholded our rights. Right from 2007, uh, we have partnered with uh, a Progressive Writers Association and a lot of other writers and journalists. The power of pen was mightier in writing our stories. And uh, when we talk about art, in Sahodri Foundation in 2017, I introduced art to our community. But even before that, we used to uh, take up art, whether it was music or uh, it was performances, especially performances were very, very powerful. Um, in 2010, I was approached by a film company to act in a movie. That was a big opportunity. I acted in a lead role in a film called Nartaki. And along with me, 25 other trans women also acted with me. The film was a story of a trans woman, a transgender dancer who was thrown away from her family, struggles, succeeds, but loses in love and then is, uh, regains her status again and becomes a voice of the community. It was a very powerful film and that was my first motion picture that I did. Uh, it was a beautiful experience to do it, to do a film and to play some of the parts of the film that I played was my own life too. The movie was called as Nerd the Key. So when we talk about art, uh, it's about films. Through films, we made an impact. Through technology, we made an impact. Through art, we made uh, through poetry. Of course, in 2014, I uh, brought a collection of my poetry called Kuri Arutin in Tamil. Uh, it was a collection of all my Tamil poems. And uh, some of those poetry still appear in the educational curriculum of uh, uh, Tamil institutions as well as many academic institutions in my state. Um, in 2017, I did my solo show of my paintings first time in Trivandrum. I found out that art hasn't died in me. It was so, so strongly uh, rooted into me. And I also understood that it was through art that I could express much more. And I took it as a, as a challenge and as an experiment to introduce art to my uh, transgender folks as well. So in 2017, we launched two projects, Trans um, Art Project, Trans Hearts Project, through which, uh, through which we actually uh, gave workshops and sessions, classes in art and creativity free to the transgender persons. We used to travel to me and my team of trans people we used to travel to different uh, states, different towns. We used to mobilize the transgender community. And we used to teach art. 
And for the first time, I found out that wherever I went to, which are place I mobilized and went to the transgender community, they were so mesmerized but by art. When they took the paint and the brush and when they started to draw or paint something, they forget the future, they forget the past. And it's like a Zen experience. The community, the person, the trans person is just focusing only on the color and the waves of the brush going up and down. So it was more like a symphony for all of us. I found out that after interviewing many of our trans artists, I found out that it really healed them. It made them to balance. Uh, making art was more like a meditation for all of us. It was not just that. We, we began to paint our stories through the Trans Hearts Project, which now we have renamed it as Turigai Project. Through this project, we expressed, on the one side, we expressed our lives. On the other side, we um, also made so many art that could be sold to, to people for, uh, for the livelihood support. So many transgender persons uh, began to make art freely. Uh, we offered these classes and workshops and art came naturally to the trans community. The transgender community is very, very um, artistically and creatively inclined. So art was something was born inside everyone. And I found out that for trans people, it was then. It was more like uh, when we experienced, when we put ourselves into art, I found out that many of them forgot time, forgot hunger, and were totally immersed into it. And eventually, many of our trans folks found art as a livelihood instead of begging and sex work. There are also many who still go for sex work and begging or begging, but they do art as a, as a personal experience, as a personal uh, healing experience. Um, through this art project, especially Trans Hearts art project, we spoke a lot about our community's plights. Many trans people are, do not know how to write and read because they never had the opportunity to complete their schools. But when it comes to painting, it is a universal language that can be understood right from anybody. Somebody from Tanzania or Zimbabwe or someone from Argentina to Chile and someone from Saudi Arabia or Qatar and Sri Lanka. Anybody, when they see a painting, they can understand the language of the artist. So once we began to create more and more art, we exhibited in the universities and colleges across India and also in galleries. Fortunately, many of the artists were able to make a livelihood of it. Not only that, it was also the power of activism also we portrayed through art. We started the Red Wall project um, through which I started to uh, bring out the voices of the communities, trans community intensely. Through the Red Wall project, we bring stories of the trans persons, especially the physical and emotional abuse, especially the sexual abuse that transgender persons go through. They never have the opportunity to speak about it. Many of them hide and bury the experiences, the wounds inside with other kind of feelings. It's buried inside, but it's still there. They don't have the opportunity to speak to anyone. So I encourage trans persons to speak about these experiences and we document it on a paper, on a handmade paper. And we put it, um, we put, we put paint on their right palm and we imprint it on uh, these papers. And what we do is, with their permission, 
we collect all these uh, testimonials. And I remember me and my team, we have collected more than 500 of these testimonials from trans men and trans women across India who speak different languages and are from different cultures, from different states. We put these testimonials with red palm painted on the testimonials. We enlarge it and we put it, we print it out and enlarge it and we put it out at the universities and galleries for people to see. And we invite young people, students and everyone to come and read these stories. So when they re when they read what happens to a trans person and, and the kind of violence we went through, these are like testimonials, hundreds and hundreds of testimonials in a room. It creates a powerful change in them, not just sympathy. It creates empathy. It creates the human uh, need for acceptance. They could literally read the outcry of the trans persons for dignity, respect, equality, acceptance through their to, through their anger and tears and openness on, on the walls that they have written. So these power, these, these were some of the powerful projects that we have. Um, through Red Wall, we do activism and I encourage trans persons to be activists and through trans hearts. It's another thing. It, it, it helps them to heal their inner wounds as well as support their livelihood. And we have another very important but very beautiful project also called Walls of Kindness. The Walls of Kindness is, is a project that we give away to the society. We go to the uh, rural and tribal schools, Anganwadis, we call it as Anganwadis. We go to this rural and tribal schools across India, the poorest schools, which are like nursery schools in tribal areas and rural areas, very poor areas, villages. And we paint those schools uh, for free. We don't charge any money. We take up paints, we go there, we stay there for a couple of days, we paint the school, we paint with rainbows and flowers and butterflies and elephants and deers, and we make the children happy. Uh, from dirty, we make the school into beauty. And we also interact with children and the staff of that school. Um, we do it because on the one side, we wanted to give something to the society. So five of us usually go as a team. But at the same time, uh, it is also an opportunity for us to learn the cultures, the tribal, rural cultures of our own uh, state and the neighborhood state. And also it becomes an opportunity for for them to learn about us, for those children to uh, learn about trans community at a very young age. They have an exposure uh, to people like us, and I think it will stay with them for the rest of their lives because we gave them a very beautiful memory. So even today, some of the friendships that have I have nourished, we have nourished in the places that we went and painted still stays. Um, these are some of the three powerful projects that we still do through uh, Sahodari Foundation. I must say that transgender people, we do face a lot of discrimination, but we bounce back. Uh, this year, I brought out my book, We Are Not the Others. We are not the others. In 2021, in June, I brought my book, We Are Not the Others, which is a collection of my poetry, uh, monologue, essays, real life conversations. And I've also, since I'm an artist, I've also done all illustrations in the book. I would like to read one poetry from the book before giving a small presentation. In page 31, of the book, I'm going to read a poetry that I wrote. Don't tell that to me. That's the title. Don't tell that to me. 
I'm tired of you telling me how I don't look like a transgender woman. I'm tired of you telling me I look just like a real woman. I'm tired of you telling me I'm so brave. I'm tired of you telling me everything is perfect except my voice, which could be more feminine. I'm tired of you asking me when was the first time I felt that I'm a transgender. I'm tired of you asking me if I live with my family. I'm tired of your curiosity. I'm tired of your sympathy. I'm tired of your stare. I am tired of your whispers. I am tired of you asking me to bless you. To you and to the million others, I want to shout, I am made of flesh and blood, of fear and hope, of joy and pain. I am like you. I am human too. And I also wanted to read another conversation from the book on page number 35. It's called A Little Girl and Me. This really happened when I was living in this uh, in the uh, in the town of Oruva near Pondicherry uh, in a village I lived called Kotakarai. Many of my friends used to visit. My friend Celia also used to visit very often. So a little girl and me. Hello, Kalki auntie. Hi, Chalema. Shall we play in the garden? Yes, yes, I'm ready, baby. Let me pick up the rings and the rope. Auntie, yes, sweetie. You're a beautiful lady, but why is your voice like a boy's? Because, Chalema, I was born a boy, suffered much, and I became a girl. Is it auntie? Yes, dear. OK, auntie, come, let us play. So um, that conversation was so fast, but it also opened. Uh, it opened my heart too, like the power of uh, a childhood, the vulnerability of a child, the innocence of a child to openly ask, ask a question without any inhibitions and get the answer and then to accept you as who you are that very moment. And then there's no hatred. There's no speculation. There was no doubt in her love. She just had a question about me and she asked me and she completely accepted me and we, were, we went to play and we played. And I think that is how we basically are human beings are. But we have been conditioned uh, to be judgmental about everything, judgmental about our us, our own individuality, and then judgmental about others, being judgmental in the name of race, sexuality, gender, culture, language, and all that. But I understood that a child is so pure that a child could immediately accept you. And I was wondering why couldn't us, all grown up people, do that? And we, we keep arguing and we have been hundreds and hundreds of years, we have been battling for that. But a small child with this purity and innocence could immediately accept it. And I wish that innocence we all have carried and that innocence of that child was like a poem, a preserved, pure poetry she was. And I wanted to document it in my book. So I put that into my We Are Not the Others. So the power of art, whether it's a poem, it's a painting, it's a movie, it's a video, is very powerful. I've seen that in my years of activism, I've seen that art creates a huge change, whether it's visual or uh, whether it's another 
any other form, art has its own power. And in my activism as an activist, trans activist, who has been working with the trans community, I've seen that music plays an important role. For example, I know some of my friends who are folk artists, who are singers, they create some of the most powerful lyrics and music that tells the story of our trans community and our mothers, trans mothers as well. These legendary stories have a huge impact on our communities. And in the southern part of Tamil Nadu, trans people, when someone is dead in the house, trans people are invited to sing um, as a tribute to the dead one. It has been a culture. We call that opari. So the transgender culture is not something contemporary. It is historical and it's ancient in India and around the world too, in many cultures, in the Native American as well, and in many cultures in Greek and Rome and in, um, in Africa, trans people have always existed. But hist history has concealed it and particularly the, the kind of education and the policies and the religious bigotry that we are going through prohibits us and puts us put, puts ourselves into a judgmental space for us to not to see a person as a person, a human being as a human being, but see them as white, black, brown, or Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew, or Indian American, African, or Dalit, or Brahmin, or Gounder, or whatever. So I think caste, religion, race, gender, sex, all these things are just one part of a human being. But besides that is the real persona. And that is, that is what um, artists see, and art sees it. Art has this, that power to unveil that, that uh, mask that we put on in the name of uh, race and culture and uh, um, language and uh, color. But besides all this, besides all these masks that we put in the name of uh, um, nationalists or whatever it is, liberalists or whatever it is, we are all humans basically. And that I think is, is where we are leading ourselves to all this education that we learn, uh, whether it's in a school or a university, it's all inclined to, to respect each of us and to accept each one of us equally, unconditionally, uh, each one of our rights and conditionally and to see each other and to acknowledge our space in the society and in the public and treat every one of us equally. Transgender people also deserve equal rights. Gay people deserve equal rights and a life without discrimination, without violence, without rape and without killing. A place around the world Many of the countries around the world are still today transphobic. And some of the countries are very dangerous for trans people too. But fortunately, in India, the scenario is very changing. The governments have acknowledged the rights of the transgender persons. Fortunately, years of activism uh, by so many of uh, my transgender uh, community seniors and my generation and people like me and a lot of others, we have, we continue to battle and be role models for our community. But we not just speak, we act and we take a lot of people as partners. We take artists, writers, filmmakers. Uh, we take up uh, partnerships with academic institutions. We knock judiciary system. We work with lawyers. Uh, we work with policymakers and government to make that change because change will not be brought by one person. 
it is a continued process. Today, many of transgender persons in India still do begging and sex work, but it is changing. Many are also uh, getting educated, going to colleges and universities, and many are working in corporate companies, and corporates are opening their doors to accept transgender peoples. And there are work policies, inclusive policies introduced in corporate companies, in universities, and all that. So the change is coming gradually. And people like me, who are poets and artists, as well as activists, we use our capacity, our power, our talent, our art in making that social change. And each one is very important. Every poem that you write, every piece of art that you create is important. Is important in making that change. Whether it's a song, it's a piece of music, if it's a theater performance, or a painting, a drawing, or a, a writing in a blog, everything is important. Everything is a voice. So I think that is where collectively our power is. You may be a person living in, living in a village in Africa or in a town in Florida or in Arizona or wherever you are, but uh, your art has a power, your writing has a power, your performance, your music has a power to make a change. And maybe today it may not, but someday it will. And that has always happened. Like I remember Frida, Frida Kahlo, my favorite artist, and also Van Gogh, who makes my favorite sunflowers. These were some of the people whose art we today value so much. We love their work. We worship their artwork, their lives. But when they lived, they lived in misery. They lived in pain. But today we acknowledge their work. We acknowledge Frida's feminism. We acknowledge uh, the beauty of art of Van Gogh. And I think that uh, their art and their life itself makes the world so beautiful. Art or writing is not just momentary. It is not just contemporary, but it stays on. It, it could make a change after you. It could make a change 10 years, five years, 50 years after you. Anything that you write, you make a piece of music or an art has the power to create a change, a social change. And I truly believe in it. Whether I write a poetry in Tamil or a poem, a piece of monologue in English or a line drawing in, in a piece of paper, I preserve it. And I believe that <clears throat> I could always use that in anywhere to make a statement. So that has been uh, uh, in my own life, my activist life and personal life. I've seen changes and in my community, transgender communities life too. I've seen changes. I have a presentation about what we do um, in Sahodari. I would like to present that. Uh, is my screen, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, someone. yes, yes. Wonderful. I'm going to present it now. So this is a presentation about uh, our Sahodari Foundation. Let me put it in full screen. Yes. So a little bit about our Sahodari Foundation. So Sahodari Foundation works for the social, political, economic, and civil rights of the transgender population of India. The foundation was founded in 2008 and is a pioneer in India in upholding transgender rights. It's a small organization and it still remains a small organization, but it has made some of the most powerful changes 
in India. And we always have innovative projects. We have been the pioneer in introducing art, films, literature, technology into the transactivism in India. When we talk about art, we have the Trans Hearts project, which has now been renamed as Turigai project. Turigai means brush. Through Trans Hearts project, we train underprivileged transgender people in art and craft and create livelihood opportunities for them, a life away from begging and sex work. For example, if you see Ramba, who's in the front with a holding a brush, um, you can also see in her neck, there was this fire burns. She was, uh, she was her, her uh, husband, she's a trans woman, of course, and her partner tried to kill her by throwing kerosene. She survived. For people like her, art is an outlet, whether it's music, or even a piece of TikTok or a painting. It is all an outlet for her to express her. And it's also for many other trans people, persons. It is a livelihood as well. This is one of our image of one of our art workshops that we held in Chennai. And we talk about when we talk about the Red Wall project, transgender people, as I explained earlier, Right, their experiences of violence they faced. And the testimonials are exhibited in universities and colleges. And we visit the poor tribal and rural schools in when we talk about the next project, Walls of Kindness. Uh, we have been visiting the poor and tribal rural schools and paint those schools and teach gender acceptance, gender diversity and tolerance for children but in their own language. These are images from the Red Wall project. So that is Saundarya in the red sari, my friend and teammate of Sahodari. She also interviewed hundreds of trans persons, encouraged them to write their testimonials and imprinted uh, their right hand palm on the testimonials and uh, it, we held those workshops and some of the pages on the top photographs where two students look at these testimonials is from uh, American College Madurai, one of the oldest colleges in India. Young students come and read it. So this is my performance, uh, poetry performance, and down below is my art. And on the right side is a testimonial. This is one of the testimonials written by trans persons. So um, if you'd like to support our trans artists, here is how to support our transgender artists and our art too. You can purchase the artworks and support trans artists. So currently some of our artwork has been exhibited at the University of South Florida uh, Department of uh, Gender and Women's Studies. The first painting that I introduce now is called An Unfinished Dream, which is currently being exhibited. It was done by these three trans persons, V. Rupakala, A. Ramba and S. Ramesh. So it is called An Unfinished Dream. It's an acrylic on canvas and it's priced at $150. And this was done by my friend, Prema, Silky Prema. It's called Cooking Guru. It's an acrylic on canvas as well. Many transgender persons profession is uh, cooking biryani and they cook it in a very, very big pot. Uh, they cook for hundreds of persons. So she captured that image cultural image and painted it. That's Cooking Guru. So all these paintings are available for purchase as well. So number three is Queer Faces, painted by my friend Sandhya. Uh, it's an acrylic on canvas as well, and it's priced at 150 USD. 
And this is my painting. It's actually a diptych painting. It's two panels. Uh, it's called I Within. It's a mixed media on canvas with uh, a size of 14 is to 5 into 21 inches. And it is two panels. Each panel of painting, each face is priced at 150 USD. So this is another painting of mine. It's Adhanari. It's actually an art print available uh, into 12 into 16 inches as well. It's number five. So once again, um, I want to show you all our artworks once again, so that if you're interested, you can tell us the number. All the art can be purchased by writing to the email address, write to Kalki at gmail.com. And this is one of our art exhibitions we did in 2017 during the early stages of our projects. So we are on Facebook, facebook.com Sahodari, on Instagram as well. And I'm on Twitter as Queen Kalki. And I'm reachable. My our official email ID is reachsahodri at gmail.com. And that's my phone number where you can connect with me through WhatsApp. It's 7639741916. And furthermore, you can visit our sahodri.org website. I also wanted to put out a word that there are volunteer opportunities as well as some unpaid internship opportunities for creative people to work with Sahodri Foundation for as less as a two weeks internship to two months internship as well. So I hope uh, you could actually uh, see our artwork as well. Currently, the Department of uh, Gender and Women's Studies in the University of California, the University of uh, South Florida, has exhibited our artwork and we are so delighted about it. Our, our artists are so delighted about it. And uh, there were many stories written in the Indian print media about how our art was chosen and uh, uh, how all the way from Chennai and uh, from India, our artwork has traveled to the US and is currently being exhibited. It's a great recognition for all of us. And of course, our voices have been acknowledged. Our art has been acknowledged through visibility and remembrance exhibition. So thank you very much for this great opportunity. And uh, now I'm open to question and answers. <laughs>